so it's my pleasure today to welcome Yi Chong, uh, who is a machine, uh, or sorry, a PhD student in the machine learning department at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, he works with advisors Archer Dubrowski and R.T. Singh and has worked on uh, interactive uh, learning problems as well as NLP and machine reading comprehension. Today he's going to be talking to us about efficient learning from diverse sources of imitation. So everyone please uh, welcome uh, Yi Chong. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, today I'm going to talk about efficient learning from diverse sources of information. And uh, let's go. Okay, it works. Uh, so today we are really living in an era where the area of machine learning is blooming. Uh, I think everyone in this room, you will have your favorite machine learning models and the machine learning applications. Uh, I'll just name a few here. So for example, on the image, net recomm uh, image recognition task, uh, we have things like AlexNet, uh, ResNet, outperforming the best human performance. Uh, more recently, on the game of Go, we have AlphaGo beating the top human players. And also, uh, more recently, um, uh, natural language processing task, the model BERT has beaten the human performance uh, on many tasks like uh, scored for machine reading comprehension. However, uh, machine learning is highly inefficient. So, uh, so the one way to look at it is the number of data they use. So if we look at ImageNet, that contains 40 million images. Uh, if we look at, uh, this is a machine translation data set. Uh, it contains uh, 50 million words from English to French. And uh, if we look at BERT, it's trained on the combination of uh, Wikipedia and book covers, and it contains 2.5 billion words. That's probably the much more than the number of images we can see in our whole life, or the number of words in, like we can read in our whole life. They are not only inefficient in the number of data they use, they are also inefficient in their uh, energy use. So if we look at their carbon footprint, this is from a recent blog post. Uh, if we train a transformer with neural architecture search, uh, uh, you emit 60 times the uh, carbon emission of a uh, human life in one year. So essentially 60 years of hu uh, human carbon emission. So that's a lot of energy, but that's only for training one model. So how can we make machine learning more efficient? How can we make it use less energy and use less data to train? To look at this problem, we should probably ask ourselves, how does human learn? How do we ourselves learn with limited amount of energy and uh, <coughs> limited amount of data? Well, there are certainly many ways to look at this problem. Uh, so one way to look at this is interactive learning. So what do I mean by that is that in traditional learning, um, uh, machine learning, uh, we learn with samples and labels. So let's say if we want to learn the image recognition task, uh, we have dog images, cat images, horse images, and we want to induce a function from the samples to labels. Well, that's a, a way to learn, but in human learning, we can learn through more kinds of interactions. So for example, we do not only learn from these examples, uh, so sample label pairs, we can also learn from explanations. Basically, you can look at the uh, maybe definition of a dog on the Wikipedia. You can learn through uh, comparisons, like uh, uh, you compare a new image to a dog image and a cat image. Uh, we can, you can also learn through other forms of Im image, like other than these photos, uh, like these sketch, sketches, uh, to learn better what a dog is. The reason that we learn from through more kinds of interactions is not only that they are more accessible to us, but they are also more informative than using the raw labels. And on the other hand, we can also combine these multiple kinds of information to unlearn our target task. So that's interactive learning. Another way of uh, uh, looking at uh, human learning is the transfer of knowledge. Uh, so this is a quote from British en Encyclopedia. Uh, human intelligence, mental quality that consists of the abilities to learn from experience, uh, adapt to new situations, uh, understand and uh, handle abstract concepts, and use knowledge to manipulate one's environment. So you can see that the ability to learn from experience and adapting to new situations is a core quality of human intelligence. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about learning from diverse information. I'll be mainly talking about two areas. 
the first one is interactive learning through diverse types of questions, uh, where we use the diverse type of questions to get more intuitive and informative knowledge. Uh, so we will be mainly study uh, uh, learning from preferences or pairwise comparisons in this talk. And on the other hand, I also talk about multitask and transfer learning from multiple domains. So that's uh, uh, the uh, outline of this talk. So I'll, uh, I'll talk about learning with preferences. Um, <clears throat> I'll be mainly talking about this work on nonparametric regression with comparisons. And I'll briefly touch uh, uh, another three works I did uh, on these uh, similar topics. And then I'll also talk about multitask and transfer learning. Uh, uh, so I'll be talking mainly about multitask learning for machine comprehension, and then also briefly about transfer learning for medical question answering. Let's do the first part. So why do we want to learn from comparisons? So this is a motivating example. So let's uh, consider the problem of estimating people's ages from their portraits. So for example, we have these images. We want to estimate how old are these people. Maybe we want to sell clothes to them. And then <clears throat> the traditional kind of, kind of query, like we, if we want to cross-source the data, is that we give this image to a person, and then we ask how old is he. So we give an x, and we get back a y. However, these kind of things are not very easy for the cross-source worker to judge because like, uh, it's not very easy based on just this one image. And also, we find that people tend to have large variance, especially for older people. Uh, on the other hand, you can ask another kind of query. Uh, basically, you give two images to a person, and then you ask who looks older. So since you have a baseline in this case, people will be easier to judge this kind of query. Uh, they will have a better accuracy, and they will take, take less time in doing such tasks. Uh, so we give a x1 and x2, we get back a z, correspond to fx1 minus fx2. So what's special here? So since we are using comparisons, uh, can we use, solve the problem using only comparisons, such as we use learning to rank? Essentially not, because our goal is to learn a regressor. We learn, need to map from the images to the, to the ages instead of uh, just ranking the images. So it turns out that we need to combine both the comparisons and the label queries to learn the model jointly. So in the, in the example here, our goal is to design an inter interactive algorithm that can decide which type of data to collect, and when, and how much. Applications of learning from preferences, there are uh, many. Uh, so for example, estimating image properties like ages, because human are often better at doing comparisons than doing direct labels. Uh, another application is patient diagnosis, where if you want to use direct labels, you have to do some invasive, dangerous, and expensive experiments. <laughs> and on the other hand, you can obtain some uh, comparisons from the expert, namely doctors. Uh, but they, the doctors can often not uh, give the, a very good quality direct labels. On the other hand, we can uh, we, uh, we also apply our techniques to material synthesis, where uh, for direct labels, you will need real synthesis to get uh, the direct labels. On the other hand, you can query the expert to provide comparisons on their expectations of different material synthesis configurations. Uh, but they cannot provide good estimate on the uh, the values of the outcome. So this is the outline of this part. I'm going to talk about our algorithm, along with the theoretical analysis, and then lastly about the experiments. Our problem setup is in the non-parametric <coughs> regression case. Uh, so that's, uh, so, but our uh, method is actually generally applicable to other forms of uh, regression as well. So let's say we want to learn a smooth function from x to y. <clears throat> and then we have an unlabeled data pool. Let's say initially all the data are not labeled. Let's say they are within 0, 1 to the d, uh, the feature space. Here we consider a semi-supervised learning setting with two kinds of labels. The first one is direct labels uh, or cardinal labels. Uh, so we have n points. Let's just say we label a subset of them, uh, a subset of n points that they are labeled. So xti, yti for some t1 through tm, they are labeled. And the label will come as yti plus fx, 
fx di plus epsilon i, and here epsilon i is the noise. It is, has some mean zero and a bounded variance. We also have ordinal labels, uh, basically correspond to comparisons. But here we analyze two types of ordinal labels. The first one is a ranking. So let's just say we initially have a potentially noisy ranking of pi hat of samples. And whenever pi hat ranks i less than or equal to j, it means fx i is less than or equal to fx j. And we also have comparisons. Uh, so for each pair xi and xj, we can query a variable zij such that uh, zij indicates the order of fxi and fxj, and it's correct with the probability of half plus lambda. Uh, yes? So, uh, so just so I understand, uh, there is the assumption that there is a, there is, these uh, comparisons are consistent with an underlying score function. Uh, these comparisons doesn't have, so the comparison here doesn't actually need to be compared. But, 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 but in so the case, ranking okay. case, they have to be. Okay. So the ranking case, we just assume we have a ranking. Uh, you can obtain the rankings through comparisons, or maybe you train a ranker. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll come to this later. And yeah. the comparison variables are That's independent. Fine. So if you, if you ask the system twice about the same pair of uh, inputs, will you uh, yeah, it will be the same? Uh, so our, our algorithm doesn't depend on this, uh, so it will never query twice, but like, you can consider, <laughs> so, so it will be either. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? All right. So, so how do we do this problem? To give you some intuition, let's first consider the case of m equals n, and then we have a perfect ranking. So uh, like here. Uh, so I explain more detail is that so a subset of m points are labeled. So if m equals n, it means every points are labeled. And uh, if we have a perfect ranking, it means this uh, statement is universally true for all fx uh, for all x i and x j. Uh, so without loss of generality, since we have a perfect ranking here, let's just assume f x one is less than or equal to f x two, and all the way to f x n is non decreasing. And we also have all the labels, since we assume m equals n, y equals fxi plus epsilon i. So the normal way, we, if we have all the labels, uh, so is that we want to induce a function from xi to yi by learning this regression function. Uh, but if we have the ranking, we can actually do better. So we can improve the labels by using a technique called isotonic regression. So the idea is that we, uh, so note that the yi's might not fit the the order here, because it has noise. So our goal here is that we fit a new set of uh, values, y, y1 hat through yn hat, where yi hat is less than or equal to yj hat for i less than j. Uh, basically, that means the yi hat sequence is non-decreasing. And subject to this, we minimize the error between, mean squared error between y1, yi hat and yi. So this program is a, a convex optimization program. And there's actually an own algorithm to optimize uh, this thing. The benefit of using this isotonic regression is that Zhang in 2002 shows that the mean square error between y i hat and f x i decays as the rate of n to the minus two third. So this is independent of whatever f we have here. Like it can be discrete or like uh, in continuous or some, anything. Um, and uh, also note that if we use y i here, yi minus fxi is epsilon i, and this will be the variance of epsilon i. So it will be a constant. So, uh, so the advantage of using isotonic regression is that we can get a decaying uh, uh, mean square error on the labels, uh, irrelevant what, of whatever f we have. So that's the case of m equals n. Uh, uh, and then let's look at the case of m less than n. Uh, so if, if m less than n, uh, so remember m uh, uh, is the number of uh, labels we have. So if m less, less than n, we will have un unlabeled samples. So let's say yj is the, uh, we don't know the label, uh, we, uh, its label is unknown. But let's say yi and yk, they are known. They are label samples that are closest to yj. What we can know about uh, yj? It turns out that yi and yk, they are nearest neighbors within the ranking uh, in the label point. Uh, so yi is the closest nearest neighbor to the left of yj, 
and yk is the nearest neighbor to the right of yj. So we can roughly just say yj is roughly yi plus yk divided by 2. So the observation here is that the ranking provides information on the nearest neighbors in the one-dimensional uh, label space. So note that the ranking is just based on the labels. It's not based on the features. So here, the nearest neighbor is uh, just on the one-dimensional label space. And we, just, we don't actually need many label samples to reach a low error here. So our algorithm is, we call it ranking regression, or R-square algorithm. Uh, it works following our intuitions previously. Uh, still, let's uh, first assume we have a perfect ranking. I'll come to a noisy ranking later. Uh, <clears throat> so, so the ranking is uh, full, right? You, it's never the case that you only have a ranking of subset. It's always the ranking of the full set. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just a, we have a lot of ranking on those. Uh, so, uh, so we first rank the set of input points uh, as here, uh, also maybe indicated by these arrows here. Uh, we label a random subset of size m from t. That's our assumption, actually. Our next step is that we run the isotonic regression on the label point according to the ranking. Basically, we minimize this program subject to the ranking. And then uh, we use nearest neighbors to infer the values here. Uh, so after this, uh, we infer the values of the unlabeled samples by their nearest neighbors in the ranking. Uh, so now we will have some inferred values. So now let's look at this. We have a space of uh, samples, and each one we have an inferred value. So basically, we here can use any uh, supervised learning algorithm to learn a mapping from the features to the to the to the labels. Uh, in, since we are in the Non-parametric case, we use nearest neighbor again. Uh, for a new point, we just use nearest neighbor in the feature space as the prediction. Any questions on the algorithm? OK, so, <clears throat> so for theoretical results, when we have a perfect ranking and the underlying function is Lipschitz, we can show that the mean square error between the prediction <laughs> and the ground truth function decays at the rate of m to the minus 2 third plus n to the minus 2 divided by d. And here, the m to the minus 2 third comes from isotonic regression step. And n to the minus 2 divided by d comes from our last step of using nearest neighbors. So for regression without using compar comparisons, so in the label only case, the MSE rate is m to the minus 2 divided by d plus 2. Uh, so this rate is. Uh, uh, exponential in D, meaning that if you even if you want a constant error, uh, you will have to use exponentially large number of error, uh, labels. Uh, on the other hand, our, our rate on, on M, M is the number of labels we query, uh, is polynomial, is independent of D. Uh, so comparisons leads to a faster convergence, and uh, label dependency is not dimensionally in de uh, not dimensionally dependent. Essentially, we can escape the so-called curse of dimensionality using comparisons. On the other hand, the dependence on n, n is the number of ranked points, is still exponential, but this is a better rate, n to the minus 2 divided by d, than the uh, label-only case. So it still shows some power of using comparisons. Uh, we can show a complementary lower bound that our algorithm is uh, almost optimal up to uh, log factors and uh, constants. Is the, is the lower bound applying only to uh, still a random draw of endpoints? So is it only applying to basically passive schemes, or could I be adaptive in choosing which endpoints to query and the, does the lower bound still apply? Uh, adaptive, I think it applies. Uh, so in general, active learning uh, doesn't quite help for uh, regression. We prove it for passive case. Uh, I think it also applies for active case. Um, <clears throat> as, uh, now, previously we just talked about we have a perfect ranking. So now what if we have a noisy ranking? And what if we want to use comparisons? So actually, it turns out that the same algorithm can be applied to the noisy ranking case, because things like isotonic regression, they are noise tolerant. 
And uh, if we want to use comparisons, the idea is that we first induce a ranking from the comparisons, and then we use our algorithm. And here we combine with the ranking algorithm from Braverman and Mosso in 2009 uh, to first induce a ranking, and then use the R-square algorithm. Uh, So <clears throat> when we have a, a, so when the observed ranking have an error of nu, this introduces another term of square root of nu in our upper bound, mean squared error. And uh, so the nu can be large. Like if you have a completely noisy ranking, if you be one, and, and then it ruins these things. Like we, we can use a cross validation between ranking regression and traditional non-parametric regression. And then we can get a minimum of these two things here. Yeah. How do you define uh, the error the ranking? So it's the number of pairs that the ranking uh, rank run. Hmm. The yes. fraction. Uh, and then, uh, so on the other hand, we can show a lower bound, uh, which is basically the same thing, but with uh, square of new instead of square root of new. Uh, so this has a gap between the upper and lower bound. Uh, on the other hand, uh, so this is our bound in the noisy ranking case. Braverman also in 2009 shows that under our assumption of the comparisons, you can induce a ranking of error uh, at most uh, 1 over n with high probability. Uh, and it uses n log n comparisons. Uh, this will be active in this case. Uh, <clears throat> so our corollary is that we just apply this 1 over n, and then you can get the rate of m to the minus 2 third plus n to the minus 2 divided by d, and n to the uh, half. Uh, and the algorithm uses n log n comparisons. So the observation here is that as long as d is larger than or equal to 4, you get the same rate as the perfect ranking case if you use comparisons. Uh, our task uh, for experiment, our task here is, yes? So if you knew that the error depends on the difference between the values of f, so if, for instance, the, the, the noise is the higher, the closer the values of f are together, as is usually yeah. the case because it's difficult for people to distinguish yeah. the rank objects that are very similar. Would, would that affect these bounds? Would you basically, would it help somehow to take this into account? Uh, so, sorry, can you, uh, so I'm not getting it correctly. So you mean so the, if you, if the you values are high? If you assume something about the nature of the errors, for yes. instance, yeah? That the error is 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 the higher the the closer the the closer the, 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 the f's are together. Yeah. Uh, Would that help somehow? Uh, not for this algorithm, but uh, in some cases, I think it will help. Uh, like uh, you can obtain. A, so uh, actually, our rank error depends on the, this new, and uh, in I think uh, in your case, basically we have a lower new uh, in in your case of in the case of you mentioned right. So what about um, partial orders that when projected to a total order have errors? Uh, you mean a partial order, like a partial ranking, or like several ranking we have? Mm -hmm. yeah, so many, many functions underlying can only be explained by a partial order that if projected to a total order are, have no consistent ranking that explains it. So in any multi-dimensional case, think about people's preferences. Yeah. I might have trade-off between two dimensions that if one dimension is fixed, right, then I then then there is a preference between them. Yeah. But between them there are inconsistencies when you project them to one thing, one dimension like a ring. Uh, yes, definitely. But we need to have a target at this, right? So I measure the like uh, so the, the, the comparison error according to the underlying function. Yeah, I guess what, what I'm trying to get at is the fact that like part of the value of the locality in the neighborhood space is that when you're comparing things in a local neighborhood, you have consistency in a ranking. When you project it to a, an overall total ranking, okay. you lose that consistency. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, maybe that's a good future work. Uh, but like uh, our algorithm generally depends on the ability that, so comparisons, even if you compare two things far away, but they are similar, you can still obtain a good quality comparison. So that's actually where the uh, power of comparison comes from. Uh, I think in general, like at least in the image estimation task, uh, people are have a like a universal goal. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
Okay, so our experiment is on estimating ages from portraits, uh, as I mentioned before. <coughs> our data set is called uh, upper real. Uh, so the name comes from it, uh, each image has uh, associated a parent and a biological age. So a parent age is how the people actually look. <coughs> and biological age is uh, how the people actually is. So our label, uh, let's just say we want to estimate the biological age. Our label will come from the biological age, but it can be limited maybe because of privacy issues. And on the other hand, our ranking, since we collect through maybe cross-sourcing, they will be based on apparent ages. So there will be some bias between the ranking and uh, the labels. Uh, we extract uh, 128 dimensional features using FaceNet. There are around 4K training samples and 2K test samples. Uh, R squared used ranking from apparent ages uh, for our training samples. Uh, we plot the curve of mean squared error uh, versus the number of curve, uh, the labels. Yes. Just to clarify, this is a data set that you created or one that uh, you so it's, uh, it is, it is the and, and how are apparent ages obtained? Uh, it's actually obtained by uh, the cross sourcing la la direct label method. It's like uh, uh, so it's thirty. You ask somebody how old this person looks. Yeah, yeah. And and just like I uh, asked thirty person, and then I take the uh, any other question? All right. So here are the experiment results. Uh, we compare to a few label-only baselines, like five nearest neighbor, ten nearest neighbor support vector regression, and our own algorithm ranking regression use five or ten nearest neighbors. Uh, <clears throat> so you can see the red line here is the five nearest neighbor, and the blue line here is the R square with five nearest neighbor, and it all performs the uh, label only baseline. And overall, the black line, R square with 10 nearest neighbors, outperformed uh, all the baseline methods. So, as a conclusion, by using pairwise comparisons, we can reduce the effort to learn a regression function. And we, re we can remove the dependence on D and, uh, so that we can escape the curse of dimensionality. So, in addition to this regression with comparisons, <coughs> Uh, I've done uh, some other works on in this area as well, like classification with comparisons, uh, zero order optimization, as well as serious holding bandits problem. There's a problem in multi arm bandits uh, with comparisons. Uh, I'll briefly touch about this thing. Um, so we can also use uh, can also do classification with comparisons. So for example, let's just say we want to do binary classification, and we can compare two samples and get a more positive one. Uh, different than regression, where we use isotonic regression, this corresponds to a binary search. Uh, and we can also combine with active learning case uh, in, in the classification case. And using comparisons can reduce the label complexity uh, also to that of learning a threshold function uh, in one dimension. So that's also a, a large improvement. So, right. So in this case, the set of uh, labels that you acquire would be uh, uh, the answer to so it's actually because uh, active learning helps with classification and doesn't help with regression. And we can also do optimization with comparisons. Like instead of uh, estimating f on its entire domain, where we do it on regression, uh, optimization only care about the optimum, or the maximum of f, let's say. Uh, so we consider the case of where <coughs> comparisons are biased, uh, meaning that uh, so maybe x uh, the comparison doesn't agree with the uh, with the underlying function f, and it has some systematic bias. It's not like just the noise. And uh, so our algorithm will optimize by first using comparisons up to the bias, and we have select a high value region like this, the green region here. And then the next step, we use direct labels to just optimize within the uh, high value region, and we don't have, we don't ever query in the low value region here. And uh, we can show that comparisons can shrink the search space to, to a much smaller region. Uh, lastly, I do this thrust holding bandits problem in multi arm bandits uh, with comparisons. So the, the, the problem setting is that given a set of k arms, you can uh, 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 identify the set of arms with mean uh, larger than a given threshold tau. You can consider a case like uh, cross sourcing uh, <coughs> binary classifications. And each arm is a, uh, a sample, and the tau is a half. So uh, basically, positive and negative samples. And we developed this rank search algorithm, 
uh, where we iterate between a ranking and a binary search so that we don't have, have to uh, rank every sample uh, in our training set. Uh, so we show that uh, the pool complexity of our ranking Rank and search is uh, all log k, where in the pool only setting, uh, you need uh, uh, k log k pools. So it's also an exponential improvement. Sorry, so uh, what is the uh, do you get a pairwise comparison or do you get a ranking at each round of uh, pairwise comparison? You know, for all these three, they are all pairwise comparison. And uh, when you say pool complexity, uh, it's that, the direct label. Uh, so how many how many ranking uh, how many comparisons do you need? Uh, roughly k log k. Okay. So since comparisons are cheaper, we get a improvement. Yeah, but so in the in the threshold in the banded case, do you do you actually get uh, f directly observations of f? Uh, so this is a multi unbanded problem. We don't have an underlying f. Like uh, you just no, no, I mean, do you, do, you, do you observe the the rewards or do you just somehow observe the comparisons? Uh, I'll observe both. I can select which one to query. So, so these are completely active. I can select first. I select which type of query, either it's comparison or either it's a comparison or a pool or direct label, uh, and then I select which two to compare or which one to query. And when you say O of log k versus k log k, do I have a similar sort of gap dependence also showing up? Like, is it yeah, yeah, you exactly. know log k plus something where? The log k is not at all dependent on the gaps, or is it still? Uh, so, like uh, this is the log k is de de assuming all the gaps are constant, and uh, okay. so the log k is like uh, so you have a total of k terms, so, and so the log k is if, log k. If I had if I if like uh, if I had yeah like a gap was epsilon, then would it just be epsilon times log k? Oh, sorry, one yeah. over epsilon About times one over epsilon squared. Yeah. Right. Okay. For pools, yes. So, oh. in the, so in the thresholding bandit case, you you get better complexity by having both queries that don't let you observe the reward, mm -hmm. as well as queries that let you observe the reward. Then, in the case when you observe only only the rewards, is that correct? Uh, so, in the vanilla case, you you just observe the a sample of the reward when you pull one on, right? Yeah. In your case, you can choose either to observe the reward on a given uh, in a given round, or to observe a comparison. To yeah. uh, compare to a previous arm, yeah, yes. Yeah. Out, out to a previous arm. Uh, can be any arm. <laughs> uh, and so in the in the in the comparison, it, it seems a bit counterintuitive, you see, because the, the comparison queries they seem since you want to to select arms that have a higher uh, mean than a given threshold, it seems like a bit counterintuitive that. By including queries that don't give you this information directly, you uh, so uh, so the assumption here is that comparisons are cheaper to get than the direct labels. So if I use one comparison to get a label, or versus one I use one direct label to get, the using comparisons is cheaper. But they still count. Each of them counts as one pool. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, the, the pool complexity actually only contains the direct labels. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, so I, I should include both here, like, uh, but actually, like, uh, uh, if we use pool complexity, uh, this low log k, and it corresponds to a comparison complexity of roughly the same thing, uh, or k log k. Yeah. So essentially, like, you essentially move most of the mass into comparisons, and then it's cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, so let's finish the first part. We have talked about learning with preferences, uh, non-parametric regression, classification, optimization, stress sorting bandit problem, a lot of things <coughs> using comparisons. So let's all shift our mind. Uh, so let's finish about this learning with comparisons. Uh, let's talk about multitask and transporter. Remember, that's also a key part of doing the human intelligence uh, that we mentioned before. So I have talked about uh, multitask learning uh, for more applied wise uh, for machine comprehension and as well as medical question answering. So before I start, uh, so this is uh, work I uh, did here, like uh, in Microsoft Research, although with Xiaodong and here and there. Uh, and uh, uh, so before I start, I uh, uh, want to say like, what is the task of machine reading comprehension? Uh, <clears throat> 
So in the machine comprehension task, we are given a passage and a query associated with the passage, and the goal is to answer the query based on the knowledge within the passage. Uh, and the answer is usually a text span within the passage. Uh, so for example, you see what causes precipitation to fall, and if you read here, precipitation falls under gravity. So the answer is gravity. Uh, here are two more examples. I'm not going into details here, but the answers are both uh, text bands within the passage. <clears throat> A problem of doing this uh, machine reading comprehension, or MRC, is that the MRC data sets are typically small. Uh, so SCORT, this is the most prevalent MRC data set, and it contains 100,000 data points. That's not a small amount, uh, but if we compare to WMT13 French to English, it contains 2 million uh, data points. If we compare the number of words, uh, SCORD actually shares the document with, uh, among many questions, so it only contains 1.3 million words. And the, the, as we have mentioned this before, like machine translation has 50 million words. And uh, Wikipedia, which is BERT training data, contains 2.5 million words. Uh, so MRC data sets are typically small, but an MRC model has more than 10 million parameters. So if you use BERT large, uh, it contains 340 million. Uh, so that's much more than the number of words uh, in the data set. So how can we learn efficiently in this case? Well, previous methods have, uh, previous work have pro proposed many methods for this, like you can use data augmentation using back translation. That is, the idea is that you translate the passage to French and then you translate back. You can also use large-scale language model retraining, uh, like ELMO, like BERT. I think there are more models nowadays. Uh, uh, but in this part, we study a different angle. Uh, as we have mentioned, we use multitask learning on multiple data sets. Uh, so the idea of using multitask learning for MRC, machine reading comprehension, is very simple. Basically, we want to train a single model by leveraging MRC datasets across different uh, multiple domains. So for example, Scott, MuseQA, MSMarco, who did what, they are all MRC datasets that we'll be using. So the outline is here. We first introduced the model architecture, and then the multitask training algorithm, and lastly, the experiment results. Our emphasis is on the multitask training algorithm. Our model, we call it Multitask Stochastic Answer Network, uh, or MTSEN. Uh, it's similar to the Stochastic Answer Network of previous paper. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, actually our method is agnostic to the model architecture, so it's not an emphasis here. Uh, the only thing we adapt the uh, original SEN is that we, the, all the layers, except the answer layer, are shared across uh, all data sets. Uh, in more detail, uh, here's the model architecture. Uh, it's actually an RNN model, uh, please, uh, uh, but I, I'm not going into detail. Uh, but uh, basically, we have lexical encoding, uh, like word embeddings here, and contextual encoding, basically uh, RSTM, and uh, memory attention, which is a transformer. And then <coughs> we have answer modules. Uh, we create an answer module for each of the data sets we are going to have. Uh, we will have span-based data sets, where the answer is a text span within the passage. We will also have multiple choice data sets, uh, where the choice is, uh, we have given a predefined set of choices, and the goal is to pick from the predefined set. Uh, our emphasis on this multitask training algorithm that we developed for MRC. Uh, we will first create, uh, uh, talk about a very basic training algorithm, and next about a multitask learning with a mixture ratio. And lastly, multitask learning with sample reweighting scheme. Uh, that's our main algorithm. So the basic algorithm is the most naive algorithm that you can think about. Uh, so the idea is just we combine all the data sets into a giant one and we train on the unit. Uh, so in more detail, uh, let's say we have k different data sets, and we divide each data set dk into nk mini batches, like this, and let's, let s be the union of all the mini batches. And then we randomly shuffle f, uh, shuffle s, uh, so that we train in random order, and then we train on the sequence of all the mini batches. Uh, so although the naive, naive method uh, does provide us some gain, it doesn't always work. Uh, actually, most of the time we only care about the performance on one particular target data set. Uh, 
uh, and we add uh, the other data sets just for external data, and then we hope to improve the performance. Uh, so let's say we train on Scott. Uh, let's say uh, our target data set is Scott. And then if you train on Scott plus news QA, uh, you get a performance gain like this. That's good. But if you train on Scott plus Marco, you get a very tiny performance gain. Uh, if you train on the combination of Scott plus news QA plus Marco, you get only a, actually a worse result than a Scott plus news QA, than if you only use two. So the observation here is that the different data sets help by a different amount. And adding more data sets does not necessarily lead to a better performance. So this is probably because when you train on the combination of three data sets, it's focusing on the joint distribution of the three, and it's not optimizing with respect to Scott. This is typically called negative transfer, and we should try to alleviate this problem. Well, one easy way is to uh, just simply downwaste the external data sets. Uh, so the idea is that in each iteration, we choose an alpha fraction of external data sets for training. And here, alpha is a hyperparameter. Uh, in more detail, uh, let's say we still have k different data sets, and we are targeting the performance on data set 1. Uh, uh, we have this alpha. And we still divide each data set into nk mini batches. Let s be first, uh, <clears throat> and let s first be the, 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 the mini batches in s, b1 to bn1. And we randomly pick an alpha fraction of mini batches from data set 2 through k and add them to s. Uh, although the mixture ratio method, uh, where we search for this alpha, can thus uh, alleviate the negative transfer problem, uh, still has some drawbacks. The thing is that the best performance is only achieved on very specific values of alpha. So if you look at here, if we use alpha equals 0 0.4, we get a performance gain. But if you use other values, we get similar performance to alpha equals 1. So that's, uh, but alpha equals 1 is just a naive method. And the searching this alpha can be quite tedious, especially if you want to set a separate alpha for multiple data sets. So if we look at the problem in more detail, you notice that different questions and answers have different styles. So this is probably due to the, the collection process of the data sets. Uh, for example, if we look at Scott, it's uh, based on Wikipedia and uh, cross-source questions. Uh, the passage is uh, Super Bowl 50 was an American football game. The game was played on February 7, 2016. Uh, the question is, what day was the game played on? Uh, February 7, 2016. So you can notice that since the cr questions are cross-source, it's a full sentence uh, with a question mark. And the answer here is chosen as the shortest text span that can answer the question. And so it's uh, February 7th, 2016. It's a very succinct one. On the, on the other hand, if we look at MS Marco, the questions are actually based on search queries. Uh, and the answers are cross-sourced. Uh, <clears throat> so if we look at the question, uh, definition of diminution, uh, diminution uh, is actually not a full sentence, because when you search, you don't necessarily enter a full question. Uh, here, the passage is a retrieval result. Says now the definition of a diminution is reduction in size or importance. When you are demoted, this is an example of a diminution. Uh, now the answer here is cross source and it's a full sentence. Uh, the definition of a diminution is a reduction in size or importance. So you can see that they are of very different styles. If we rewrite the MS Marco in, in score style, uh, so it will be what is the definition of a diminution, a uh, full sentence. And the answer will be a reduction in size or importance, a more succinct answer. To make the problem more uh, complicated, it's not every sample from MS Marco like this. Uh, uh, so if we look at this pair, where was movie the birth film? So the user actually do does uh, the user actually does uh, enter a full question, and the answer here is. Uh, position in Northern California, so it's uh, so, uh, so short, short uh, succinct answer. So both of them, they are similar to scores. If you look at this, bulimia, whatever, uh, so this is not a full sentence. So the question is not similar to score, but the answer is a succinct answer that has, this is similar to score. Uh, so the question in the third pair is similar to score, what is the hummingbird most? But the answer here is very long and probably noisy, <clears throat> so it's not similar to Scott either. 
So our goal here is to weight the samples according to their similarity sample, similarity to our target data set score. So that we only use the useful samples. So we use our we raise our algorithm using multitask learning with sample reweighting scheme. The idea is that we compute a score SQPA for every training point question passage answer uh, triplet in data set K from K from two to through K. Uh, recall that D1 is our target data set, so we compare, compute a similarity score uh, S, uh, for every external data points. And when we perform the gradient update, we simply multiply the loss by the similarity score SQPA that we computed. So now the question comes to how can we compute the scores? Um, <clears throat> here we propose to use language models to reweight each, each sample separately. Uh, this is inspired by data selection techniques uh, in machine translation. Uh, in more detail, uh, we have k data sets. They set one through data set k. They set one is the target. And uh, we train a language model on each of the data set, LM1 through LMK. The idea is that we will favor samples that are similar to data set 1, but different from data set K. Uh, in more detail, uh, for example, PQA, uh, passage question answer for this from data set K, we use the score S as LM1 of the triplet minus LMK of the triplet. So LM1 measures how similar is the triplet to data set 1. We want this score to be high because we want similar samples. LMK is the uh, similarity score, uh, is the similarity of the triplet to the inter in domain, the data set K, external domain. We want this score to be low because uh, we do not want to bias our model too much towards the distribution of the external data set. So as we discussed, uh, the major difference between the data sets lies on the questions and answers. And we will decompose as LM1 uh, of the question minus LMK of the question plus LM1 of the answer minus LMK of the answer. And next I will describe how we train the language model on the two forms of data. Our language model on the questions, we use the state of the art model on Pantry Bank. It's a smaller scale language model corpus. Uh, each model is trained from scratch on the corresponding data sets questions. And we use the cross entropy score, uh, which is basically the minus log of the next word prediction. Uh, on the other hand, for the answers, we do not actually train a language model because the answers are typically very short and uh, they mainly contain entity names. So that means if you train a language model, you encounter many unknown words and that's not effective. Instead, we only use the frequency on the answer length. Let FREQK be the answer length frequency in dataset K and we use the minus log of the frequency of the corresponding lens. Combining everything together, uh, we train this, uh, uh, we have this similarity score by using the language models. And further, to use the scores to weight the loss, we normalize the similarity scores SPQA to be between zero and one. Uh, combining everything together, uh, we, uh, we use the similarity scores to weight the, the loss. And lastly, it's about the experiments. Uh, we train uh, four data sets, Scott, NewsQA, MS Marco, who did what. Uh, they are of similar size in terms of the number of training questions, around 100K. Uh, but they are different in te their text domains, uh, like Wikipedia, CNN News, Web Search. And uh, for Scott and MS Marco, they tend to have a short passage, around 100 words. Uh, but for news QA and who did what, they have much longer passages. And the answer type, uh, uh, so Scott and news QA, they use text bands. MS Marco is a natural language sentence, cross-sourced. And who did what is a closed data set, uh, multiple, or multiple choice, where we are give, given a predefined set of answers. And uh, Scott and news QA, they have short answers. MS Marco have a very long answer. And who did what? The answer here is constrained to be a person's name. Uh, so who did those things? Uh, it will be uh, just one or two words. Uh, here are the results on score and use QA uh, based on our uh, sample reweighting methods. Uh, on SCORD, if you train a single task, uh, the ELMO model gives you 86.6. 
And if you use multitask learning, you get a 2.5 performance gain. Uh, on the other hand, for use QA, you get a similar thing. If you train on single task, uh, you get uh, 70.4. And if you train on three tasks, you get 2.4 performance gain. Uh, we mentioned that uh, our performance outperformed the uh, human performance <coughs> in terms of both the exact match, uh, not presented here, but uh, as well as the F1 score presented here. <coughs> and uh, here's a comparison of different data augmentation methods. Uh, if you use back translation, uh, it's based on the QA net. Uh, uh, it gives a uh, 1.1 performance gain. Our multitask learning is based on the stronger model of stochastic answer network, and it gives a 1.5 performance gain. ELMO gives 2.0. It's more than multitask learning. But if we combine ELMO as well as multitask learning, it gives an additional 1.7 performance gain. So the observation here is that the benefits of multitask learning is more than that from back translation, and it is also orthogonal to the benefit of ELMO. Lastly, here's a comparison of uh, different multitask learning strategies for MRC. Uh, so the orange bar is the sample reweighting method, and you can see it outperforms all the baselines uh, uh, in both settings. And it alleviates the negative transfer problem. Uh, lastly, here's some generated scores for several QA pairs. Uh, so here, here's a sample from News QA. Uh, where's the drought hitting? Argentina is very similar to Scott Dell. Uh, still, it's um, based on similarity with Scott. Uh, it's his, uh, leads to a, a high score. And uh, this is a sample based on MS Marco. Uh, you can see it's not similar to Scott, so it leads to a 0 0.2. We still give a positive weight to those samples. In general, samples in news QA uh, have a larger uh, weight than samples in Marco. So this fits our intuition that news QA can help more than MS Marco. And uh, in a nutshell, uh, in, in, in all like all the samples uh, have an average of 0 0.6. Uh, it's higher than the yes, the weights we search from mixed duration. Sure. So for the reweighting part, I was wondering if I were to uh, do a log likelihood based uh, reweighting, uh, which is how likely am I to see the sample in data set one versus data set two. Uh, and a way I could get to this log likelihood is basically by trying to uh, learn up, um, let's say, a logistic regression type model, which is uh, trying to tell whether the sample came from data set one or data set two. Uh, uh, do you mean a train a classifier on that? Classifier, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, cl classifier that outputs conditional probabilities. Uh, actually, our algorithm is uh, so our, we train language models. Uh, we do not train the classifier, but the language model is a uh, density estimator. So uh, right, but it's it's <coughs> it's strange to take a difference <coughs> of two densities because uh, if you wanted to really correct the expectations, you would take a ratio of densities. Uh, yeah. So actually, I write it here. Sorry. Uh, so our uh, so normally you take like say Lm one minus the so the sample minus um, k of the sample, like this. Uh, this is the next word prediction. Uh, but this will be a very sparse uh, thing, like uh, because like news QA is very hard to believe it belongs to Scott. It will be very close to zero. Which is, which is why I would not compute the two things so separately is, and take the ratio, but uh, directly learn uh, a conditional probability estimator for whether the sample came from data set one versus two. And the important part is that if my conditional probabilities were calibrated for that prediction problem, then they will give me the, the likelihood ratio. Yeah, yeah. Which, which is a trick people have used for yeah, yeah, density yeah. score estimation in, um, in in the literature pretty commonly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, yeah, uh, it still be good to use yeah, the measurement. Yeah, it seems like a natural baseline. To yeah. Uh, I just want to mention one thing. Like mm -hmm. uh, our method is that actually like we instead of using this value, we take oh, the log of it, I see. and uh, it's great. basically log of the L um, one minus log of the. Um, Uh, all right, we have finished this uh, multitask learning for machine reading comprehension. 
Uh, I briefly talk about this uh, transfer learning for medical question answering. Uh, so it's actually a competition that we enter. Uh, so MediQA, medical question answering, 2019 competition. Mm -hmm. uh, the goal is to do natural language understanding in medical domain. Uh, I ignore the, so this uh, consists of three tasks, uh, natural language inference, question entailment, and question answering. So our method is, we call it multi-source transfer learning. Uh, so our goal here is natural language understanding in medical domain. And uh, we transfer from two sources. Which the first one is natural language understanding in general domain. Here we use a GRU model, MTDN, uh, also developed here, uh, <coughs> to, uh, to transfer. And we can also transfer from language modeling from medical domain, where we use SciencePert, uh, BERT model trained on science tech, text. We can fine tune both models on the, <coughs> sorry, on the medical NLU data that we have. And our goal is to combine the knowledge from both models. Uh, so we mainly use uh, ensemble method to combine the, uh, combine the knowledge, but we can also use knowledge distillation uh, to combine their predictions. Uh, <coughs> Uh, our fine-tuning process is a multitask learning process where we use actually use the mixture ratios with uh, alpha equals 0 0.5. Uh, so combining the knowledge from MTDN and Cypert, we use a majority vote for the, all the tasks. And in case of tire, tire, tie, uh, we resolve by average scores. Uh, we also tried knowledge distillation uh, using, by using the prediction of Cypert as the target for MTDN. Uh, but it didn't perform quite well in our experiments, so we mostly use ensemble method. As a re result, we get the best performance on the question answering task in terms of accuracy, and uh, gets the third on natural language inference and seventh on rich question entailment, recognized question. And here's a comparison of uh, difference uh, of single source ensemble and multi source ensemble. So these two are single source ensembles. Uh, so the Orange bar are the the average accuracy before assembling, and the gray bar is the uh, accuracy after assembling. So you can notice that single source assembling these two are uh, have much lower accuracy than multi source assembling. So that finished the uh, most contents of my talk. Uh, lastly, I would like to give an overview of my PhD research. So we covered uh, many aspects, actually. So my research is uh, centered around learning from diverse inputs. Uh, covers both learning from prefer with preferences, um, this four things we have covered, uh, and as well as multitask and transfer learning uh, of these two. I've done a bit more on uh, learning with preferences, uh, such as linear regression, uh, and comparisons in clinical trail, and strategy proof conference peer review, where we use uh, reviewers' preference on the papers to induce like uh, uh, what what's the best paper, what's the accepted paper set. And uh, I'm also interested in broadly statistical learning. I have developed methods for active learning for graph neural networks and uh, quantization techniques for linear linear classification. Another interest of mine is machine reading comprehension. I have developed uh, also in, in, in an internship here. Uh, and machine reading comprehension using multiple attention strategies. Okay, so building upon that, uh, so I'm going to talk about some future works. So one thing that I'm very interested in is uh, apply this preference-based learning to reinforcement learning. Uh, the idea is that in reinforcement learning that we sometimes have to de hand design the reward objectives. So for example, if we want to train robots, we want to play games, the, maybe the, the, the naive way of designing the reward is not very, uh, it's very sparse and uh, it's not very hard to learn. And if we hand design some reward objectives, this might not lead to the best performance and then might, might not behave ideally either. So can we, can we utilize human preferences on trajectories in place of the reward function to better, uh, uh, to better shape it? 
So I'm working on efficient exploration method based on a policy cover. Uh, I'm also interested in uh, optimization view uh, in the case of a uh, linear quadratic regulator uh, case uh, where we use uh, uh, comparison-based optimization to uh, to do preference-based reinforcement learning. Another point of view is that can we use preferences to help accelerate the learning? Uh, so, you know, in addition to the so maybe we can observe the reward, but in addition to that, uh, given some policy and action pairs, we can observe the better one so that we can so it's similar to the imitation learning setting, and this can help to shrink the search space. Uh, generally, I'm interested in human in the loop learning. So can we use human intervention to accelerate learning? Uh, so I talk about preference learning. They can be also used for things like machine translation as well. So suppose we want to translate French to English. <coughs> uh, so this is source sentence in French. Uh, the traditional query is that we give this sentence into, into a cross-source worker, and then we ask, what's the translation? Uh, so the, 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 the worker has to type one word by one for the translation. On the other hand, we can also ask comparison queries uh, that we give two uh, potential translations, and then we just ask what, which is better. This is much easier and quicker for a human to answer, and, but it will be less informative because uh, it's a binary answer. In general, I'm interested in preference learning for varied applications like uh, machine translation, question answering, dialogue systems, um, more broadly recommendation system, information retrieval, they can also use uh, preference. And uh, user can also provide rationales, suggestions, corrections on the prediction. And I'm interested in the combination with reinforcement learning, uh, so that is called reinforcement learning with auxiliary information. Uh, I'm interested in the combination as well. Uh, lastly, about this transfer learning uh, that I mentioned. Uh, so I'm interested in transfer learning from multiple sources. Uh, nowadays, transfer learning is just many-to-many uh, -many mapping. We can transfer from many sources like BERT, CYBERT, Roberta, uh, GLUE, uh, Knowledge Base, like FreeBase, uh, many other ta uh, data sets, uh, to our target data, target data like uh, maybe summarization, specific domain, NLU, like question answering, uh, common sense reasoning, and many more. So which sort model should we transfer from, and which data set should we find on? So that requires more studies on the, like say, task similarities, and uh, we can also work on meta-learning to select what sources uh, to, to transfer from, and then maybe we can use a bandit view of the models. And another question is that how can we combine knowledge from multiple models? Maybe we can use knowledge distillation, uh, and we, maybe we can develop architectures for combining models. And thank you. That's it. And what questions are welcome? Mm. Yeah. So for uh, preference-based R-type scenarios, I was wondering uh, if you've uh, got any thoughts on how to uh, deal with sort of the what I might call the cold start problem. So initially, when my agent starts out, they, they basically know nothing about a problem. And if I ask somebody, how are you going to rate uh, this terrible outcome versus that terrible outcome, they're probably just going to scratch their heads with no idea what to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how should how should I deal with this? Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, actually, we start with a policy cover. Uh, so the idea is that you you try to constrain the the, the the like the branch of the so the branch of the trajectory you, you do uh, it's like uh, so maybe uh, you make a, uh, initially you only let the trajectory branch into uh, like maybe say in the last step mm -hmm. so that uh, so the human only needs to compare like uh, what should I do in the last step like when you have done better in the last step, you branch in the second last, like this. So it's uh, essentially some kind of dynamic program based method. And uh, so to do this, we initially to, to, to use the policy cover. So in a sense, imitation learning and, and universe reinforcement learning could be viewed as preference based RL in the sense that. I mean, the human is demonstrating you a policy that 
Yeah. Implicitly, they're preferring to, to anything else. Uh, so could you use that to initialize? Basically, if, if, you, if the human does give you a demonstration. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think, use, um, of use. course, demonstration is a much stronger supervision than preferences. But if you, if you were given a demonstration, how would you then use it to switch to this mode of, uh, to your mode of preference-based RL? Uh, so one way is that we can, well, of course, like we can use the demonstrations uh, like uh, so, the, a demonstration is uh, better than like say a, a trajectory generated by our model. Uh, so that's one way. But uh, so uh, I'm more targeting about uh, like preference based IO is that like uh, the human doesn't know what way to do. Like uh, maybe like you want a robot to uh, just say fetch a bottle, uh, but uh, <clears throat> the human doesn't know like uh, so you naturally do this, but. Uh, you don't know how to teach about the robot. So essentially you are, you, you want the, uh, so instead of uh, demonstrations where you teach the robot the best thing to do, you also want to differentiate between like, uh, maybe this time the robot reach out is better than not reach out. So even among these partial, partially correct preferences, partially correct trajectories, you also want the, uh, the preferences. So that's the way I, I, I would say like preference based in reinforcement learning, like in some cases it might be more helpful than just you have the compare, the demonstrations. From the first part of your talk, I was mm -hmm. wondering if you had any examples or did any analysis of like the types of images um, for the age prediction that your uh, method worked well on versus some of the other methods which had worse regression scores? Uh, I haven't done many error analysis actually. But in general, like uh, people have a larger variance on older people. So you think that most of the improvement of your model yeah, has come from better predictions of older, older people? Of the older. You can see that the, the, the error is uh, still not very low. <laughs> like uh, that's mostly because of the older people. Like for people of 60, mm -hmm. uh, you might judge it having 70 or 50. That's fair. Any other questions? All right, well, with no other questions, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you for listening.